And um, actually you can and we can already do many things on many scales. Uh, but uh, well, Anu Pam and Zubatu and Jungschik um, had also papers out there saying, well, we can go maybe up to 10 to the 14 mass limits delocalized things. This is not yet where we are, but we can look at what are the challenges on the source site detection site, um, interferometer site, and what would you win by trying to get there. Um, so this is kind of a review of the various steps of size scales um, from relatively small molecules to big ones where we are right now, and um, how to extrapolate that to nanoparticles. Um, this could be easily a full lecture of full, throughout an entire semester with four hours per week or 14 weeks or something like that. Huh? So we have to limit somehow uh, the scope here today. Good. And before I start with, um, oops, let's see, that works. Okay. Never before I start, of course, I should um, acknowledge there are many, many people who have worked on these experiments throughout the years. Some of them are now also professors in England or in other places. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it, it used to be a medium size or big group. And um, the picture that you see there is from last year when we were still allowed to stand together. Um, and um, so the new people are on the left hand side, the former people on the right hand side. And since this is all recorded, um, the credits will be out there on YouTube anyway. And there were nanoparticle physicists also from um, uh, nanofabrication people from Israel, from Tel Aviv, which is not Steve, Fernando Kapolsky, and friends. So, but that's um, just to give credits to the people. And as an introduction, uh, since that has all to be put into a framework, you know that quantum mechanics is all here close to the hundred, to the centenary, so to say, of the Boyle's idea of meta waves. That will be in two years. And um, this is an old story in a certain sense. So, from that point of view, everything I'm going to, to be talking about today is kind of trivial huh? because that's 100 years old. <laughs> but the technologies to implement that for bigger things, uh, they're of course modern. And you know that for electrons, this has been shown very early on for neutrons, even for atoms and diatomic molecules like hydrogen too. This is 90 years old. People have seen diffraction of that, of these components already very early on. And nevertheless, it took quite a while, another 50 years or so, to get um, to real atom interferometry as we know it now, um, and also diatomic molecule um, interference experiments in the mid 80s, 90s, beginning of the 90s in particular. And then also, as you know, there started this huge wave, literally huge wave, of um, called atom physics, Bose Einstein condensates, where you have super large ensembles between a thousand and a billion or so of um, ultra cold quantum degenerate um, atoms, which are in the temperature range of anywhere between picocalvin and microcalvins, depending on the mass and what you do with them, with very, very low binding energies on the scale of nano electron volts, where the de Broglie wavelength is still per single atom, and therefore huge. If you get to the recoil limit, it's really the order of the wavelength that you use for cooling. So that can be up to micrometer the Broglie wavelengths. And coherence lengths on the millimeter scale, if you wish. Uh, so that's a very macroscopic thing. But in each of these experiments, um, the individual atom is doing its quantum stuff for itself, even though it's coherent. It's more like a laser. Um, and as uh, Zubato mentioned, we started in 1999, these days together with Anton Seilinger, um, to look into a different regime of yeah, matter wave physics and quantum physics, where we are rather looking at very strongly bound particles, covalently bound particles, van der Waals bound particles, <clears throat> which would um, be internally very hot, uh, because that's how we prepare them. We cannot get them as cold as Bose Einstein condensates. And where we still can see quantum interference in the center of mass motion. And um, in a certain way, that's indeed surprising because these things may have internal temperatures of 1,000 Kelvin or so, where you would not expect quantum physics to be very relevant. Uh, but you will see in a minute how that works. And um, you will see a range of experiments that we did with um, macromolecules on essentially all scales. Um, from the fullerenes in the beginning to polypeptides nowadays to macromolecules composed of several thousand atoms and in this case 25,000 mass units. And the question is how to push that. And I'll briefly talk a bit about um, 
or nanoparticle and metal cluster experiments and silicon experiments and, and how to get that to bigger scales. Now, why should we do that at all? Um, this particular seminar is about quantum gravity. And to be honest, our group and I think everybody's group is still pretty far away from quantum gravity in that sense. Huh? Because if you, if you really want to have a particle in superposition and have that as a source for gravity, gravity is extremely weak. Um, Vanderbilt's forces are much, much stronger. So to get into the regime of uh, where gravity is really relevant, nobody knows exactly where that will kick in. But there's a bunch of theoretical proposals where you would say, well, around 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 mass units, that would be kind of intriguing to look at. And um, well, if, I'll come back to that a bit later. Maybe if you go to 10 to the 14 mass units and very large spatial superpositions, you can also look at entanglement due to gravity. But that is, as you can see, on, on the scale, logarithmic scale, as far away, at least the 10 to the 10 mass units or so, as far away as we are now already with our techniques from the electrons 90 years ago. <clears throat> so there's a philosophical challenge, if you wish. Oops, it's not non-classical, but non-classical states. So the question is whether you can prepare non-classical states of mesoscopic systems where everything becomes complex uh, to look at the interface between quantum physics and classical physics, which has still many interpretational and open issues. So, um, is there a wave function collapse? Is everything only decoherence? Um, are there many worlds? Uh, can we test anything like that in, in experiments? And um, there are mass dependent tests of new physics also in the sense that, um, well, dark matter, dark energy may couple differently to these things. And that's a very applied aspect. And that is, well, once you prepare these sensors that are sufficiently sensitive to test these quantum mechanical superposition states, then they're also very sensitive force sensors or accelerometers. You know that for atom interferometry, which is extremely advanced and it's really is now quantum technology in the sense that people are giving money for that. For nanoparticle quantum superpositions, that's not yet so much the case of the molecule metrology, but there will be acceleration sensors, torque sensors, rotation sensors, um, chemical sensors um, that will exploit these techniques that we also are developing here. Now, um, there will be a sidetrack. Um, most of the seminar is about quantum and gravity. Uh, I have to admit that a big part of my heart is also about quantum and biology. Not, I, I, I avoid the term quantum biology because that's a little bit fuzzy still. It's, it's really only about doing quantum experiments with biological objects. And again, the question is, why should we do that? And um, so first of all, it's interesting just to see what we can do. It. Uh, it's a little bit like in the state of when we started with the Puderines, people, and some people at least said, well, half of them probably would say it's trivial, it's just quantum mechanics. And the other half would say it's almost impossible because there's internal vibrational modes, rotational states, um, they, they emit thermal photons and whatsoever. So decoherence becomes more complex if these things become more complex. And um, as you can see from the right hand side picture, which is a chromocytin, for instance, or a protein um, underneath, um, <clears throat> they're pretty complex things. And the question is can you bring them into superpositions? Can they maintain their function while they're in superposition? And, things like that? and um, that's technologically very interesting because um, there's hardly any technique available for producing new um, neutral molecular beams on that complexity scale. Mass spectroscopists um, are mostly interested in ions. Uh, we're interested in the neutral molecules. And we think we can learn about these molecules also in the neutral scale. And that is what we can learn. It's, that's the, the part that I'm not going to talk about today, um, the kind of physical chemistry part. But um, that's also a very big branch in our group, where we think that we can contribute to measuring all, all kinds of molecular properties, electronic, optical, magnetic, structural properties of these molecules in the gas phase, which is an interesting thing, but not the topic of today. So um, just to introduce, well, the basic idea of doing meta wave experiments is, is what you learn in textbooks. So can you do a double slit experiment? Can you do a grating diffraction experiment? And that's also how we started very early on, 20 years ago by now. But I'm, I'm not going to show the, the um, experiments from 20 years ago, but the more recent ones where you see uh, the molecules really physically by I more or less by CCD kind of. 
So that was an experiment that we did in 2012. Um, just to illustrate as a kind of pedagogical ex experiment um, that hot molecule interference is, is real, that can really see that. <clears throat> and in this case, and also for all future um, things that we will be talking about today, the question is always, how can you make, how can you make a source? What kind of diffraction mechanism can you have? What kind of detector? And how do you avoid decoherence? So these are the four ingredients that you wish. Source, interferometer, detector, and avoid decoherence. And in this particular case, the source is just um, the focus laser beam. So the laser beam hits a glass plate, which is the interface between air and the vacuum. And um, wherever it hits the surface, it evaporates the molecules. It's a very tiny focus of a micrometer size, 1.5. And because of that tiny width, and Heisenberg's uncertainty tells you, well, delta X is kind of limited, so delta P must grow. And that is the reason for delocalization in that case. And even though these molecules are internally, well, in this case, probably 900 or 1,000 Kelvin internally hot, they delocalize because they were first very strongly localized. The source is a very localized source. And it's very easy that textbook or elementary high school um, example to calculate the transverse coherence that you get. If you do this, and that's of the order of a few microns, if you start with the de Broglie wavelength as tiny as five picometers in our case here. So that's really small. You also need small gratings to diffract these things. In this case, you see the nano grating, which was fabricated at Tel Aviv University, Maurice Wisniewski and friends. And um, so this had a 100 nanometer. Uh, period, 50 nanometer openings, and if you send a molecule like the thalocyanine through it, you will hope to see diffraction and interference. And to show that it's really on the single molecule level, um, we collect the molecules on the slide, illuminate that the laser light, image that on the CCD camera, and what you see is single lobes of molecular fluorescence patterns, and um, what you get is these um, recordings. Um, <clears throat> and you see how the in interference pattern is built up from the individual molecules. So, and that was entirely also on the cover of nature because it's kind of pictorial. Um, <clears throat> but that clearly demonstrates a single particle quantum interference nature of these relatively, well, nowadays they're small molecules, but in, in these days they are complex molecules. Um, they had a mass of 514 mass units and several dozen atoms in them. And of course, they have rotational states, they have vibrational states, they're all highly excited. Uh, rotational states up to a few hundred vibrational states. Uh, well, in, this is not C60, but if you think of C60, this would have 174 different vibrational degrees of freedom, and it would all be highly excited. But the interesting thing is, in order to do the experiment, you have to collimate the molecular beam. And if you do that, the transverse temperature, if you wish, is as cold as in the Bose Einstein condensate. Collimation makes that the velocity and transverse velocity is so low that um, you could assign temperature of 100 nano Kelvin to that. But in the forward direction, it's still 1,000 Kelvin. So there's a huge temperature difference, if you wish, between the forward direction and the transverse direction. And that's how it works. And um, the de Broglie wavelengths are very small. And in textbooks, you would typically say, well, you see only diffraction if the wavelength is comparable to the grating period, but that's not the case here. There are high orders of magnitude in between, and it still works. And it will be much more dramatic for the future coming up experiments. Now, this is a nice idea. And ideally, you would always want to do such an experiment because it's so visual, so to say. But in order to get to higher masses, and we're really talking about well, scaling this up to real high masses, um, the simple half fit diffraction idea simply doesn't work. And that's easy to see um, because you need to collimate the beam to better than the diffraction angles. In this case, that was 10 microradians already. If you scale this up to insulin, which is 10 times more massive, you would have to go to a single microradian diffraction angle. And then it starts really to become extremely difficult to get them through the slits. There are Van der Waals forces, all these things. There are no sources to allow us to do this. So that's why we took an idea that actually John Clauser already put proposed many years ago, uh, 25 or 25 years ago, to use a tablet long interferometer scheme. And we modified that to what we now call the Kapitza-Dirac tablet long interferometer scheme. 
which we are actually using, we have been using for 10, 10 years roughly, but I will essentially show you only um, one specific and modern implementation of that, uh, which we call the long baseline universal met meta wave interferometer, and also in the version 1.0, because we're working on 2.0 right now. So the question is, can we build a universal interferometer in the sense that, um, that we can really manipulate in the same machine, not only a single brand of atoms, like most atom interferometers, because they are typically resonant with one specific atomic line, but can we use one and the same machine to see quantum effects with all sorts of atoms, small molecules, large molecules, maybe clusters of molecules, clusters of atoms? Is there a machine that would do that? And um, actually, you will see the various molecules and particles that we interfered in the few minutes. But the idea is relatively straightforward. Um, it's also a three grading interferometer. Um, like in the good old days of um, well, Dave Pritchard's first experiments with atoms were also three grating interferometers with mechanical gratings. We also did mechanical gratings in the beginning, but then quickly realized that uh, if you want to go to more massive things, you need to go to optical gratings because of the simple fact that Van der Waals forces will essentially close the entire diffraction slit so dramatically that you won't either have transmission or even if you get transmission, the phase scrambling by the position dependent Van der Waals forces, they will wash up the interference back. So we need an optical grating at least in the middle part. Uh, and in our future experiments, we will have all optical interferometers. But anyhow, so um, the general layout is as follows, and there's a small movie to go through that. Um, there has to be a kind of source. In this case, it used to be still a thermal source. And that's kind of surprising, um, even in hindsight for me, that if you take a 500 or 900 Kelvin source, you just evaporate things like the fullerenes, also the vitamins, you can also evaporate them. And, um, and they come out, they come out in a thermal distribution, not at all very coherent. They have a transverse coherence in the beginning of a few picometers, not at all suitable for interference. But now there's this first grating, and that, that has a 266 nanometer period in this case. And um, so that's the detector, the mass spectrometer. Sorry, I'll come back to the interferometer in a minute. Uh, that's a quote mass spectrometer just for electron impact, ionizing the molecules and then mass selecting them and counting them. So, but the first grating, what, what is the purpose of that? Oh, sorry, first the <laughs> Um, It's just to show that we also have honey molecules in there like vitamins, no? but yet the hydrocholesterol, alpha tocopherol, many things. So there's the first grating. And the molecule is like a ball. Of course, that's uh, not to be taken too literally, no? but it, it enters here like a little ball. It has a, hardly any transverse coherence on the order of picometers. But the first grating is then the magic part where it happens because diffraction at each individual slit in the first grating prepares the transverse coherence by the same effect that I mentioned before. You have some localization, it has to pass through one grating slit. And this grating slit is only 110 nanometers wide in this case. Um, so that generates, um, sorry, the transverse coherence and then it comes close to the second grating. Um, it seems that stopping the interferometer doesn't work so well. So here, um, I, I will not stop it again. <coughs> but then you see as a diffraction grating, um, an optical standing light with a green laser light. And <coughs> this um, green laser, so this is repeating, it seems not good. But anyhow, um, this green laser is in implementing the dipole force grating. Um, we act on the polarizability of every particle. And that makes it so universal in that sense. So forget about the carotene, we'll come back to the interferometer in a minute. But um, the dipole force really makes that an electric field, which is applied from the outside, which is the laser field, pulls on the electrons um, in any of these particles, be it atoms, molecules, nanoparticles. And so it induces the dipole moment. The dipole moment interacts with the electric field, d dot e divided by h bar times time, that's a phase. So there's a phase shift whenever the molecule is going through the node or the antinode. Actually, only in the antinode, there's a substantial phase shift. And if the molecule is delocalized across at least two of them, there's interference. There are two possible paths to get to the detector. 
And the detector in this case is a third weighting that scans across the interference pattern. And what you expect to see is a kind of, in this case, sinusoidal fringe. And the amplitude of this fringe, the visibility, so to say, that is what tells you how quantum the thing was. And so that was this the relative rough outline. And this kind of near-field interferometry is what we have been using now for a decade, roughly, and what we certainly used to for a while, because it scales much, much better in terms of mass and machine length than Hartley diffraction. <clears throat> so um, just to mention briefly before I get to the bigger stuff. Um, so in these interferometers in Hartley diffraction and in, in this near-field interferometry, we looked at a variety of different molecules and they all interfered to a nice contrast could be uh, and the interference fringes could be exploited to measure something about these molecules, like their polarizabilities or absorption cross sections. And, and we had um, yeah, antidepressants like hyperacine, we had antibiotics like uh, cyprofloxacine, vitamins, and whatever you want. So, and that's kind of, in hindsight, not surprising, but you see how they're, they're floppy, they're flexible, they, they're internally hot, they, they rotate at 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 per second, and they vibrate in all degrees of freedom, so they, they're shaky on the picosecond scale. They change their conformation on the nanosecond scale, and in spite of all that, they do their quantum trick, because we are mostly, and here still exclusively, looking at the center of mass motion, like pure de Broglie interference. Now, so that experiment was stretched recently, um, and that's what we call LUMI, the Long Baseline Universal Atomic Interferometer. It's not as long baseline as some of the atom interferometers nowadays are, which can, which are installed already in 10 meter fountains and are currently being set up for 100 meter fountains with a perspective for 1,000 meters. Here it's still only two meters between the first and the last rating in a five meter machine, but still. <clears throat> It's 10 times longer than the instrument that we have for the vitamin experiments, so it can address higher masses, has higher force sensitivity. And um, other, other than that, it's, it's very similar, uh, except for the technical details are very complex. Uh, you have to vibrationally isolate these, these things tremendously well. That's why we have multi, multiple pendulums um, to suspend an inval of 160 kilograms in high vac high vacuum, in which uh, if on which you place these uh, nanomotors with which you can position the gratings with nanometer accuracy and a few 10 micro radians roll angles. So everything has to be pretty precise. Alignment of that interferometer actually took an entire year. And now that it's done, it's a daily routine to, to have this operating. It was very robust, <clears throat> but it took a while to get this going. Um, still surprisingly short, um, Jakob Fein started his thesis and after three and a half years, he had already the papers published more or less. So that was a <clears throat> relatively quick experiment. Just give me a second. Um, so <clears throat> in that interferometer, we had various things to interfere, atoms like cesium, barium, strontium, molecules from fullerenes over not anthracene but anthracene, coronine, adamantine, uh, tripeptides, and finally also very big molecules, and that's what I will be talking about now, mostly. Um, the machine, as it is at the moment, is designed to cope with De Broglie wavelengths as tiny as 50 femtometers. Um, this is not very much bigger than an atomic nucleus, if you remember. An atomic nucleus would be of the scale of a few femtometers, so it's 10 times bigger than the nucleus for a single atom. But in this case, it contains 2,000 atoms. Um, and well, the, the mass is not yet at 100,000. Currently, we're around 28,000. <clears> but um, if we can prepare sufficient slow sources, it will go up to, in this setting, up to more than 100,000 mass units. Um, but that is also a very sensitive force meter, if you wish. Currently, we're sensitive to forces on the level of 10 to the minus 26 Newton. And, um, yeah, that is because these particles are still relatively light. So that is our kind of record holder currently. <clears throat> and um, if I say this is the record holder, of course, it's not a single record holder because that's a family of molecules, to be honest. Um, our friends in Basel, around Marcel Major in the chemistry department, 
um, stick, they, they synthesize these molecules with a very high fluorine content. Fluorine shell, the yellow part that you see there, that's actually fluorine atoms, the gray part is, is carbon atoms. And it has this high fluorine content. Well, the purpose of that is kind of making a Teflon shell. It's not Teflon, but the purpose is the same, to make them less sticky so that you can still evaporate them. Um, you may know, and we'll come back to that, that it's very hard to evaporate proteins. Actually, it's impossible. They would first denature, unfold, and then break apart. These molecules, they stay intact. And they do that because of these very strong carbon fluorine bonds. And because the polarizability is extremely reduced because of this strong binding of the electrons between carbon and fluorine. So you can still evaporate them. That's kind of interesting. Well, these molecules are not, strictly speaking, in an oven. And they were dissolved with a, with a pulse laser. But uh, they were coated on a plate and then dissolved with a pulse laser. And then they fly. And they fly with the speed of Nerdas. So typically, you would say, you need cold atoms to do quantum interference experiments. These things are as fast as an Airbus A320 or so, or any of them. Could also be a Boeing, huh? not sure. But a, a fast airliner, they're 300 meters per second fast, so nearly supersonic um, in air. And nevertheless, at the mass of 25,000 mass units, between 25 and 28,000, you have a 1,800 to 2,000 atoms per molecule, and one of them. One very specific choice is, is shown here. You see the number of atoms is involved. Um, and with this combination of speed and mass, you get a very tiny Debord wavelength, 50, 60 femtometers. And it's, it's really interesting to point out that it, it's not a single structure. Of course, every molecule for itself is a single structure, but there are no two molecules that are equal, very unlikely. Um, because when they make these molecules, um, they have a kind of skeleton to which they bound chains of um, perfluoralkylated, uh, perfluoralkyl chains. And um, it's like in the lottery, so to say. Not every bond is always connected and is extremely unlikely to find the same molecule twice. And in addition to that, they all are in highly excited rotational states, vibrational states, conformational states, uh, different foldings. So. There are literally billions of different structural isomers and conformers in these things. And um, so that's why I claim that with that single experiment, we had already more, a, a larger diversity of particles in matter wave interferometry than the world has, has ever had in any experiment. If you count all the atoms together, all the molecules together, the single experiment had much more different um, uh, molecules in a single experiment. And still, you see a very nice interference pattern with the expected contrast, because they are all roughly within a few percent in the same ballpark of mass and velocity. And as long as you only look at the center of mass motion, as long as you do the oil interference, um, they all add up coherently. So they all add up, contribute to this same interference pattern. So, um, <clears throat> and of course, we have to prove that this is a proper quantum interference effect. and um, you may worry that if you take, say, your two hands and uh, look through, then you also see a stripe pattern. That has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. That's just more of a shadow imaging. So you have to make sure that uh, what we see is really a quantum effect. And so you have to vary something, either the wave, which is the velocity, or you have to change how the phase imprint in the grating is changed. And that is by varying the laser power and the grating, the middle grating of the interferometer. And that's what's being plotted here. Um, the variation of the laser power that imprints the phase in the middle grating, um, and the variation of the contrast, the fringe visibility as a function of that. And of course, there would also be a modification of classical billiard trajectories if you do that, but that's shown in the red curves. And that's really very clearly distinct from the quantum expectation, which is the blue stripe, and the experiments that you see here in black dots. So, um, and well, is this surprising or is that trivial? In a certain sense, it's quantum mechanics and it's trivial. Um, I'm still a little bit surprised that it worked, even though we made really effort to make it work. But um, these are very hot molecules. So they have really literally almost 6,000 different vibration degrees of freedom. Not all of them are coupled um, by infrared radiation, but many of them are. 
So, and they're, they're highly excited. So they could emit thermal um, radiation. That's a big roadblock for super large interferometry, so to say. But the thermal radiation is, is long wavelength compared to the 266 nanometer superposition that we generate. And there's still sufficiently few, only a few photons emitted, so to say, on average, that even phase diffusion by many infrared photons is not yet an issue. But that's really a subtle point. Um, if you increase the temperature by 500 Kelvin or 1,000 Kelvin, that wouldn't work anymore. And uh, for bigger things, we have to go to lower temperatures. <clears throat> so what could be bigger things? There are two different directions. On the one hand, well, this molecule is already, it has actually the same mass as the green fluorescent protein. That's also 27,000 mass units roughly. And so a natural question is, can we interfere in natural structures? Because it's nice, nature produces, it's nature's nanotechnology at its best, if you wish. Nature produces mass-selected nanoparticles, um, be it, um, in this case, the protein, the GFP, or in the end, COVID-19. They are very nicely um, mass-selected structures. And um, as, as you know, and as I mentioned, um, it's very hard to make sources for neutral, slow biomolecules. Mass spectrometry has many, many techniques to generate ions, but uh, in order to avoid ion uh, electric field decoherence, so to say, we have to go to neutral particles. And one way of doing this is, um, is a bit counterintuitive. In, in this particular case, we're looking at ramicidin A1, which is a polypeptide made up of 15 amino acids. Um, it's antibiotic, um, but nowadays I think it's no longer for sale, but um, because it's still for sale for, for research, but not as a drug at home. And um, so you code that on, onto this black wheel, which is a carbon wheel, and then you shoot with a laser on top of that. And then you would say, well, shouldn't I avoid very strong heating because heating is what kills the molecule. And actually, the opposite is true. In this particular case, you have to extremely overheat it. You have to go to terawatts per square centimeter, which is a super gigantic intensity, which we derive from a femtosecond laser, tightly focused with 70 microjoules and that rates that we can choose. Um, here in the blue at 343 nanometers. And this super intense uh, femtosecond laser beam overheats the sample very quickly. And when it goes into the gas phase, into the vacuum, actually, it is entrained in a cold stream of helium atoms or argon atoms in this case. So a cold supersonic expansion of, um, of atoms. And um, yeah, this, this kind of trick works. <clears throat> We've even done this for polypeptides up to 20,000 mass units, and they still went into the gas phase intactly um, in combination with our friends in Basel. But the interference experiments were done here with that antibiotic. And um, a very important part of that is, I don't see, see if you see my mouse here, but it was very crucial for the experiment that it had three tryptophans, at least three tryptophans in them. Um, because tryptophan is the only amino acids out of 20, which would ionize if you shine 157 nanometer light on them. That's a very peculiar fact of nature. Um, so you need tryptophan in these things to get it work. So that's here. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so we did that, and then we exposed that to, again, another interferometer, which has a very similar concept, but now this is all optical. It's, again, a near-field interferometer, three gratings. The first one prepares coherence. The second one imprints the phase. The third one scans across the interference pattern. Now, the, the difference is, first, it's a super short wavelength. 157 nanometer will make an 80 nanometer grating. And um, so it's, it's very tiny. And second, uh, it's in the time domain. There's, the interferometer is never on as a whole interferometer at the same time. They come in a pulse sequence with 20 microsecond separation in this case. Um, they're on for only 10 nanoseconds. Everything has to be timed extremely precisely. And then again, every Anti-node will act like, like a bar in a nanomechanical grating. Every node will act like a slit. And so you prepare coherence in the first grating, detract the molecules at the second, and probe um, the appearing, appearing interference pattern with the, with the third mass. 
which is again the same laser. And if you do that, if you scan across um, in time in this case, instead of space, um, that's a bit more complex to explain, but um, it's essentially boiling down to the same effect. You probe the interference pattern and you see the expected contrast. So even for these polypeptides, it worked out very nicely. And um, I think this optical photo depletion stuff, in this case was ionization in future experiments with proteins, it will be photo cleavage that will cleave off a certain tag of the proteins um, that will be that can be extrapolated to larger proteins. And we're working on that. Um, I skip this one, this is only briefly to show that um, as a kind of document, if that is recorded, that there's really applications to that, that we can measure things. And if you're interested in what we call molecular metrology now, quantum assisted molecular metrology, then just contact me. Um, on the philosophical note, um, we always kind of claim that this is also kind of a Schrodinger's cat. Well, you know the story about Schrodinger's cat, I can skip that in a certain sense. But um, well, the idea is to prepare macroscopic superpositions that are complex and in, I would claim that's my personal definition that it should at least contain one biomolecule, otherwise it's not a cat. But that's a very specific definition only for me. But um, what we actually do superpose is not that in the life, but um, they're really macroscopic superpositions of relatively massive things. And um, there's still an issue whether we can call that mode entanglement and whether you can exploit that entanglement, that's an open discussion. Um, and uh, we had some of these discussions already with Lasse and are continuing this. So what, what kind of fundamental tests can you do with that? Um, there's a variety, and um, I can only briefly highlight a few uh, without going into the facts and details. <clears throat> but one of the questions is, is quantum mechanics valid on all scales? Um, maybe you would say, well, yes, it is. But then you still have to understand why do we look so localized in practice? And the very naive reasons, like um, my, my, my H bar is so, so, so small that my De Broglie wavelength is so tiny that while I'm walking on the street, my De Broglie wavelength is even so small that it's smaller than Planck's length, if you wish. And then space and time even make no sense in a certain sense. So that is kind of a trivial reason why we're classical. But um, is there any transition to more classical phenomena <clears throat> induced by something? And, and that something could be spontaneous collapse, which have been predicted by Girardi, Rimi, Weber, Pearl, and um, many of those who well, I don't see at the moment here on my Zoom panel, but I, I know that some of you are working on that field too. And the idea is that um, it could be that you extend the Schrodinger equation by some term, some nonlinear term, that leads to a spontaneous collapse of the wave function every now and then to a certain minimal wave packet size, if you wish. Um, the inventors of that idea thought that this minimal wave packet size should be of the order of, say, 100 nanometers or so, um, just to make it compatible with the known experiments in these days. Um, but the rate should be should scale somehow with mass or complexity, with the particle number they thought in the beginning, and then we normalize that to mass. Because um, if it doesn't, it would be hard to explain why electrons can and atoms can interfere so nicely, even over half meter distances in seconds, while we don't see, at least not yet, viruses or bacteria interfere. So um, the question is, what are the collapse rates? What are the collapse lengths? And uh, how can we probe that? If that model makes any sense. <clears throat> um, but just to point, oops, point out briefly, so if you can see my mouse in this um, their master equation, um, there's the typical von Neumann part, which is the coherent part, and then there's this collapse rate, lambda, and it collapses to kind of, in this particular model, to Gaussian state. And the width of this state is what we're interested in. And um, so um, with, with our experiments with the 27, 28,000 mass unit particles, be localized over um, 266 nanometers over 10 milliseconds or so. Um, that already sets some bounds, and I emphasize that it's interferometric bounds on these collapse models. I should also mention there's 
a number of other tests that, that you can perform to search for this effect. And um, the simple reasoning behind that is that um, if such a collapse occurs, you shrink the wave function, so you must increase energy. The curvature is increasing, um, localization is increasing, so you must increase the energy. So you, you can also just, in quotations, search for heating in very cold systems. And people have done this in cantilevers, in cold atom systems, in nanoparticle systems, and um, they're making very, very good progress there. Uh, people have looked into the um, generation of X-rays in a dark chamber, so to say, from a semiconductor, because if electrons are localized this way, then would it have X-rays? And so in terms of the best bounds on these models at all, I think um, the absence of X-rays is currently the best. In terms of quantum tests of these models, um, our recent interferometer is setting the best bound. <clears throat> and um, there is a very broad range of parameters and will still take a while to be excluded. Well, it can never be excluded entirely, entirely, because you can always look for lower rates and um, yeah, lower rates. But at some point, it wouldn't make any sense anymore. So if you can really have a 10 to the 9 mass unit or 10 to the 10 mass unit particle, be localized over seconds and hundreds of nanometers, uh, I would say that model is killed. But um, that's still a little way to go. Um, you can also rephrase that, and that was what Stefan Ulrich and Klaus Hornberger did, and look for some macroscopicity parameter where you compare different experiments and really different experiments like um, squids, atom interferometers, um, cantilevers, molecule interferometers, and search for a parameter um, of macroscopicity, quantum macroscopicity that you can compare. Um, I'm not theorist enough, and we don't have time enough to go into all the details, in particular, if you want to apply that for all the different experiments. But for our specific experiments, there's one parameter that you can derive, and that scales with mass squared, as you can see in the upper right corner, normalized to the electron mass. The, the time you maintain coherence and and then there's the one over the logarithm of the fringe visibility compared to what you expect as fringe visibility. So that is an interesting parameter <clears throat> that at least for meta wave interferometers you can compare across all systems, but you can actually also compare it across cantilever squids and, and whatever. And in, in that scale, <clears throat> LUMI, our most recent interferometer, is really kind of the, the leading value, if you wish, has the highest macroscopicity compared to neutron interferometry, atom interferometry, and so forth. Um, but that's, that is only one very specific microscopicity parameter, of course. There are completely different parameters that you might want to look at. For instance, how far can I separate my wave packet? And in that case, of course, the atom interferometry in Mark Hesserich's experiment right now with half a meter is, of course, leading neutron interferometry is pretty big with tens of centimeters. Um, you can look for other parameters, too. But in, in this particular choice, um, our reason interferometer is quite leading. But what does that really mean, this parameter, the 14 for mu? And, and, and you can easily derive that from this little equation in the upper right corner. If you wanted to get to the same macroscopicity with electron interferometry, you would have to maintain coherence in this electron interferometer with the same fringe visibility normalized over 18 million years. So in this case, mass really helps. <clears throat> and that is one of the reasons why we do high mass interference also. Um, yeah. So if you want to look it up, it's a different neutron atom and molecule experiments. Um, I don't, I forgot to put in the, the reference where we also, where this paper is, is, is linked. Oh no, the paper's in, in the title. Yeah. So there you can look it up. Okay, how can we push that to higher masses? <clears throat> There's one straightforward thing, uh, because what would we be interested in? Everything. <laughs> We're interested in uh, biological objects, really big biomolecules, proteins, um, because it's interesting to do spectroscopy, magnetic studies in these interferometers. Uh, I think in the end, we could even contribute a little bit to the question whether um, the navigation of, um, of birds has quantum aspects, because you may be able to do quantum <clears throat> uh, spin lifetime measurements, excited state lifetime measurements, 
uh, on individual proteins also in these interferometers. So that is one of the motivations to continue with biological things. Um, currently, we're setting up uh, working on metal cluster experiments. Hafnium cesium is kind of ruled out already, but hafnium is a good contender. And um, they're nice because you can make them abundantly, as you will see, and um, also internally cold. There's still the intriguing question of whether we can go to the living world. Bioreads are not living, but they're pretty close to that. And then the mass range that our interferometer in principle can handle, if we can only make a source for that, um, and if we can legally handle them, <laughs> Bioreads are a little bit, I have to think about biosafety also, but, um, <clears throat> but they're definitely in the mass range of our present interferometer. That's the positive news. And the next generation of experiments will also have to deal with nanoparticles. And in our experiments, we are rather looking into 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 mass units, not yet the 10 to the 14 that we can talk about in the end, simply because the preparation of the quantum states is easier and we gradually step up one by one. Okay, so how is that done? Um, that is the outline of the experiment that is currently being built. It's not yet done. Um, the, the blue part is kind of in the lab already, and the right hand part is a light blue part. Um, will appear in uh, the next one, two, three years. <clears throat> but the idea is to take a cluster aggregation source, a magnetron sputter source, uh, which can generate essentially anything. If you want a metal cluster, tantalum, titanium, aluminum, niobium, whatever you like, you can do that in that source. <clears throat> um, the idea is to have yeah, sputtering in a cold environment, aggregation of metals into bigger clusters, and the mass range that you get is between a few atoms per cluster up to, if you wish, also a billion or so. So it, it really covers the entire range. That's an advantage, but at the same time, it's also a disadvantage because you have to filter, filter them out. Otherwise, there's a huge bunch of things that you don't, that you cannot handle at the same time. So you have to pre-filter them, and that's what we do in cortical mass filters, um, which you can also use as a buffer gas state. And <clears throat> neutralization of metal clusters is straightforward. Photo detachment is easy. So making neutral metal clusters is relatively straightforward. We're working on that right now. Um, and Bernd van Isendorf was a big help there already uh, in former years when we started this. Um, one has to worry a little bit about um, beam flux and beam collimation, beam brilliance, phase-based density. And that's why we are working on cooling techniques there too. But um, it will be combined with a three grating, three ionization grating interferometer of the tablet law type that we had already. <clears throat> and again, be combined either with mass spectrometry or imaging. So that will probably take us to about half a million mass units, hopefully in not too far future. That's very difficult to promise on video, so to say, because it will uh, keep me accountable then in a few years. But uh, the honest promise is we're working on that. And <clears throat> this is uh, yeah, describing the ideas a little bit. Um, we're also working on the protein interferometry, but then for that you need neutral proteins. And what I didn't tell you so far is how to make neutral proteins. And currently um, we're in a European project, which is called SuperMama, like superconducting detectors for um, molecule no, mass spectrometry and molecular analysis. And that is a European consortium where we're trying to prepare neutral biomolecular beams and to detect them with superconducting detectors. And we're making good progress there. And the basic idea is to start from electrosprays. And you can spray essentially anything up to COVID-19, if you wish. And <clears throat> so you can spray them. You can charge produce them, which is a big challenge somehow if they're super highly charged, which most of them are if they're massive. But you can bring lowly charged molecules in, into a beam, introduce them into, into a high vacuum, cool them even in a buffer gas cell if you wish. But then you still have to neutralize them in the end. The gratings should be neutralization or photo depletion gratings. And we have successful experiments already with insulin. Um, where you see the, the outline of the experiment on the left hand side. So you spray the molecules, 
um, I'm not sure if you see my mouse, but if you see it, um, we spray them in air. They're introduced into a high vacuum to ring electrode guides, um, are filtered by a quadrupole mass filter, are guided into a hexapole buffer gas cell, which uh, has called noble gas to cool them to 60 Kelvin currently. Um, and then they're guided into, well, here, a time of light mass spectrometer. So far, it's only in quotations a mass spectrometry experiment. The, the preparation site for the quantum experiments is then by introducing a laser beam. In this case, this pulse nanosecond, in this case, laser beam is introduced to hit the insulin molecules. And well, if you look at the insulin shape here, uh, it's an amino acid made up of 51 amino acids. But at the end of the amino acid chain, this polymer, there are four to keep the text that were made by uh, Valentin Köhler, Marcel Mayo, and friends. And um, Luna Shetty was a student in that lab. And they produced these funny, but for physicists, it, it look a bit, they look a bit, um, well, you don't know why they're there. But they have an aromatic ring to absorb light. And that this very specific blue group here, which has a charged tag and which cleaves off as soon as it absorbs a single photon. So that is a photocleavable linker that um, removes a charge from insulin in this case, just by removing this tiny tag. And this way we can, with photons, with light, control the charge state of the molecule. And if you make a standing light wave of that, you can make a photocleavage grating. We haven't done the cleavage grating yet, but um, the mechanism works. And um, so I, I don't know, uh, you should stop, stop me probably when I'm talking too long. Huh? I'm, I'm getting to the end anyway, but um, this is a seminar on quantum gravity. I'm not a quantum gravity guy, but the question is, what would you see if you go to higher and higher masses? And we also have silicon nanoparticle experiments, cooling experiments. Um, so if we're also going for 10 to the 6, 7, and then 10 to the 10 mass limits in the end. So what would, be, would you be able to check? Um, my feeling is that time will not allow to speak about every of these things. But um, the question is, can you check gravitational waves? Would there be any gravitational redshift that if you have a split, split wave in different altitudes, such as at different heights, uh, would they accumulate different phases because of the um, gravitational redshift? There had been ideas already early on. They came mostly from England, first Purcell and Strunz, and then also Wang and friends, saying that, well, if you have space-time fluctuations, these space-time fluctuations uh, will shape the interference pattern differently on the right and the left-hand side. So is there kind of state diffusion on space-time fluctuations? And naively, you would say, well, this cannot be the case because they would happen on the Planck scale, but um, predictions were that if you go to 10 to the 10 and 11 mass minutes, maybe you would see something. Um, <clears throat> also on the quantum gravity side, if you wish, um, two proposals that came out three years ago by, well, let's, let me call it the Bose team. Of course, it's an authors more involved than probably many of them sitting here in the audience. And uh, Malet and Vidral, similar ideas. If you generate superpositions of very massive things, we're talking about 10 to the 13, 14 mass units, and if you are able to generate two of them next to each other, then they can couple by gravity to each other. They could entangle by gravity to each other. And if they do, then there must be some quantumness in gravity. So that's an intriguing idea. But in terms of mass, that's very far out from what we are doing right now. Um, because at the same time, if you go to these high masses, entirely other things also come in. Uh, I'm not talking about decoherence, which is a kind of natural enemy, so to say, always like collisional decoherence and thermal decoherence, but um, also decoherence by dark matter. Maybe. We all don't know what dark matter really is, but um, dark matter must exchange some momentum if it couples to ordinary matter at all. And um, well, one way of measuring very, very weak momentum transfer would be doing matter wave interference. And already at the mass scale that we are heading for right now with 100,000 mass units, I think uh, a few hundred thousand mass units, I think we will be able to set new bounds uh, for very specific forms of light dark matter with, with dark matter energies between, say, a few 10 electron volts up to mega electron volts. So not the typical either giga electron volts or, or axiom type. 
um, dark matter species. Well, then there's this kind of question about continuous continuous localization it has nothing to do with gravity to zero order, but there have been modifications of uh, these models to introduce gravity as the cause of collapse, both by <clears throat> by he or she and Roger Penrose. By the way, congratulations to Roger to his Nobel Prize. And um, so, so the idea is that gravity could be the culprit, so to say, that collapses the wave function. Um, this would, it, it's very hard to set it down, uh, but I would expect it not to happen before 10 to the 10. More recent papers also with Angelo Bassi suggest that could rather be beyond 10 to the 12 mass units, if at all. And in this mass scale, there's also semi classical equations, the Newton Schrödinger equation, um, where Nico Dolini is doing theory, and uh, the Gossard where they had proposed that the wave function would be modified if in superposition, but then really for tens of thousands of seconds for 10 to the 11 mass units. So that's very long coherence times for very high masses. This is only to say this is extremely demanding, extremely challenging. All these things to be tested are extremely challenging. And to be honest, for the gravitational wave background, but I need to talk to the gravity guys here. Um, I think in the end, it will be easier and faster to do experiments. If you want to use it as a gravitational wave detector, I wouldn't go for high mass. I would go for the lowest possible mass. I would go for hydrogen. And if you want to talk about that, I would be happy to do so. Um, I think there are much better ways to do gravity wave detectors with hydrogen. But, um, and Christian Brandt in Ulm is thinking about this now intensely. <clears throat> now, that's that's one possible part where I could stop. Um, I can go on for, for a very long time. Uh, I can still talk a little bit um, about what are the requirements for really high mass things. And um, so probably yeah, you should just should tell me um, how long you still have patience. Is there Please go ahead. Nice. You are left already. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Hello. You can go ahead. Um, Anupam, any any suggestion for how long you still can endure this? You can have ten more minutes. Ten. I, I don't hear you. We can have 10, 15 minutes, maybe. I still don't hear you, but I, I don't see you. I don't, don't see you too angry, so I yeah. keep going a little while. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so. So in order to get to these high masses, um, so one of the very, very big challenges is to prepare the sources. Setting up the interferometer is then kind of the easy part. Detecting high mass things is the easy part because if you have a particle that is 100 nanometers in diameter, you can almost see it by your bare eye. If not by bare eye, in an optical microscope, you can see it already. So even a 30 nanometer particle, you would see in an optical microscope. Even with spatial resolution of the fringes, that tricks how to do that. So the detection is a piece of cake. Diffraction is challenging. It's challenging if you want to go beyond 10 to the 8 mass units because then optical beam splitters will make so much radio scattering that you have a hard time doing this. Um, well, many people have thought about that. There's a more recent paper also by Mauro Paternostro and friends. Um, so around this mass range, optical gratings are not the best choice, maybe. Which is why um, Boreal romero also was thinking about magnetic skate parks and why Marcus Aspermeyer is also looking into magnetic skate parks. So that, that is all interesting, but you can also make beam splitters that are not non-periodic, not grating-based beam splitters. Um, I will not have the time to look into that here today. But the beam splitting part, I think that can be sorted out on the mass scale 10 to the 10. 10 to the 14 will be much, much harder, uh, and there we still have to think. But preparing the states, um, that used to be a, a big challenge, and is getting that there's tremendous progress recently. So the question is, how can you make, how can you non-destructively and reproducibly launch particles in a high vacuum? Because in the end, you need to avoid decoherence, so it has to be in a high vacuum. Um, well, do you want to do that with a single particle or with very many? That's a matter of taste. Um, some argue that you can recycle the same particle if you can really handle it. Um, 
we are also working on sources that would generate particles on the kilohertz repetition wave, um, so make a kind of nanoparticle gun. Um, the choice depends a bit on the experiments, but then you have to cool and slow them. Um, you don't necessarily need to get to a trap ground state. That is also cool if you can do that. But um, for meta wave interference, that's not always necessarily needed. Internal state cooling depends on the time you want to observe this thing. Um, you need to avoid term decurrence, that's clear, from the outside, from the inside. Um, but that depends on if you can delocalize your particle very quickly, then the demands on internal state cooling are reduced. So for 10 to the 6 mass units, the suggestion is that even a few hundred Kelvin could still be OK. For 10 to the 14 mass units, no way but to go to the vibration and ground state at least. And if you need very long coherence times, rotation and ground states would be cool. But that's very hard to prepare. So <clears throat> this is um, a wish list. It's not like um, the criteria, the DiVincenzo's criteria for quantum computing in the sense that you don't have to fulfill all of them at the same time necessarily, because if you can improve in one degree of freedom, you may relax a little bit on the other. So if you have a better confinement in the beginning, you get a larger momentum uncertainty, so the faster spreading of the transverse coherence. Then you can afford to have a shorter interferometer term and um, have shorter decoherence times, so relax a little bit on thermal and collision, collision and decoherence. So um, that is why I don't prescribe here one experiment that will lead us to success. There are many opportunities, different approaches, and also followed by different groups. Um, <clears throat> then, yeah, to, to make these initial states from the beginning, of course, some of these experiments really want the highest possible mass. But that's not always the case. For instance, for collapse model testing, um, we'd rather want to have something like 100 nanometer superposition, even if it's only 10 to the 8 mass units, than a femtometer superposition at 10 to the 14 mass units. So for, for that kind of test, there's a very specific parameter set. But, um, and, and as described in, um, in, in the Bose and Maletto papers, if you wish, um, for this gravitational entanglement, you need very large separations, 100 micrometers and of high mass. So that's a combination of the most demanding aspects. So, but what is the advantage of larger and smaller particles? Well, obviously, larger particles are much, much easier to launch. Uh, the Van der Waals forces increase with particle volume, but they decrease with the center between the different particles or particles to the wall. So um, micron spheres you can just shake off with a piezo. Um, 10 nanometer particles are extremely difficult to launch. That is also why many of these gravity cooling experiments took such a long while, because the launch of the particles was one of the roadblocks. Um, if you have larger particles, they are very easy to act upon. Mm -hmm. You can do optical scattering. That scales if it's Rayleigh really scattering, like the polarizability squared. So it's d to the six. So it's a huge advantage if you want optical scattering. But at the same time, optical scattering is a bad guy if you want later um, gratings, optical gratings, and that's a roadblock beyond 10 to the eight roughly mass units. Um, dipole forces also scale with polarizability, again, with the size cubed, the volume. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, so that, that is what you gain for larger particles. For smaller particles, obviously, um, they can delocalize much more quickly, much more widely. Uh, the ground state wave function of the harmonic oscillator is written down there. The transverse coherence of a, of a propagating particle beam is written down there. They both scale inversely with the mass of square root, with the mass of the mass. So it's much easier to do a quantum experiment and to probe for various other decoherence effects that enter before gravity is an issue if you start with lower masses. And that is why we follow this strategy to step up mass in, in, in really factors of 3 and 10 instead of jumping directly to 10 to the 14. Um, and this wide delocalization is also better suited for everything that needs very weak momentum transfer, which is dark matter search, collapse models, anything where you want to be very sensitive to very long wavelength perturbations. <clears throat> and um, well, of, of course, the decoherence would be much reduced for lower masses, um, but we need to push it anyway. <laughs> so 
just to just to mention the big and tremendous progress that has been made um, in many groups now is this quantum state preparation, the, the internal cooling of nanoparticles, mostly silicon or silicon dioxide particles. Um, the, the first experiments in the field were really on feedback cooling. Um, in Mark Raisin's group with Wong Kang Yi, and then Lukas Nobotny's group with Jan Giesler, uh, Hendrik Ulbrich is the Bob Roche group, and uh, Kunang Yila <laughs> is uh, Roman Pidan's group in the ICPO. So there has been a continuous progress in feedback cooling, cold damping, and, um, and almost to a trap ground state nowadays. Then there's cavity cooling of the Sisyphus type, um, which we have also been doing in my group. Um, there have been progress over the years. Uh, it's not yet in a ground state with this technique that we're working on micro cavities. Um, again, in Spain, there was this of sideband cooling, and big progress was um, seen also here in uh, Marcus Aspermeyer's group on coherent scattering cooling to the ground state. Um, very close to that, also Lucas Nevatman's group. And most recently, even five. 5D feedback cooling um, on Yanano dumbbells and Tong Kang Yi's group. Um, 5D because you have two rotational degrees of freedom. And then there are many, many other teams. Um, so I didn't explicitly mention Peter Barker, which is the paper with James Milne in front. And um, James Milne himself is now also at King's College doing nanoparticle cooling. And they have many interesting ideas um, being set up on how to do electrical feedback cooling, magnetic cooling, sympathetic cooling with other ions, so the entire community. Um, cavity mediated cooling, so there's, there's a huge field growing, and that's very, very good to see. Um, most of them are really currently working on single particles, and that's already difficult enough. And to make that reliable, to have cooling on the millisecond scale and reloading on the millisecond scale to really get. Um, meteorological device built from nanoparticles that will still take a while, but that's big problems. And just to mention, and that's probably then the con concluding story, uh, if, you to, if you're still with me. Um, so in, in my group, we also had cavity cooling of silicon, in this case, instead of silicon nanoparticles. Um, and the launch in this case was what I call LITMOS, laser induced thermomechanical stress. Um, a pulse laser shooting on a silicon plate, releasing by, by the induced stress the nanoparticles on the other side. They fly into the cavity, and in the cavity they're being cooled. So the cooling scheme is um, what, what I mentioned as this kind of Sisyphus cooling scheme, where the cavity is loaded with an intense laser beam, but the laser beam doesn't perfectly fit into the cavity. You would have to red detune the cavity a little bit to make it perfectly fit. And this additional red detuning comes by introducing the nanoparticles. So when the nanoparticle enters the antinode of the cavity, it couples to the light field, shifts the cavity resonance in such a way that more light gets in, but with a delay. And the delay is such that uh, the particle always sees a higher potential when it runs uphill than when it runs downhill. And in the end, it's being cooled and trapped. And well, this method. We've, we've shown that it works, um, but and we've extrapolated that to two-dimensional to, to, to nanorocks, so non-spherical particles, which are interesting both in silicon and because they are biological things that, that are very similar, like the tobacco mosaic virus. For these particles, we have not yet seen the cooling. Um, we're still working on the sources. Um, as mentioned, for viruses, it's harder. Um, for the nano rods, they had for the kinds of cavities that we had still not the ideal length, but it's making progress. And there's really um, an interest also in doing interference in the rotational degrees of freedom, not only in the center of mass motion. I'm not sure if that will, but well, this rotational degree of freedom can also help test some of the collapse models. If it's probably also the gravitational collapse models. Not all other gravitational issues can be tested with that. But uh, there's a strong theory group doing this um, around um, Klaus Hormack and Benjamin Stickler in the University of Duisburg in Essen. And um, they had various predictions how to do that with Sisyphus cooling, how to do that with cavity cooling. And whatever they do and predict, they always end up with, yes, it can be done. You can do 5D cooling or 6D cooling on any particle 
of between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 10 mass units. Um, the coupling to the light field becomes very difficult if you go much beyond 10 to the 10 mass units because then the particle is bigger than the wavelength and then you average over the potential. So if you're thinking about doing interference experiments with 10 to the 14 mass units, like uh, it has been proposed for gravitation entanglement, these techniques are not ideal because 10 to the 14 mass units is really a big thing. It's a few microns. Um, so you would have to think of other cooling schemes. And magnetic trapping and cooling is, is a good idea. Feedback cooling with electric fields might be a good idea, but optical things were not the ideal one. So uh, let's give this one uh, and summarize. Um, so what we've been doing in our lab is really meta wave interference with atoms, with macromolecules, with biomolecules, from vitamins and peptides, with organic clusters, metal clusters, working on nanoparticles. So it's really kind of universal in the sense. And we are hoping to see growth in the community in all these fields. And uh, sorry for being so long, <laughs> but then thanks for bearing with me for such a long time. And uh, I'm open to questions. Okay. That's uh, that really excellent. Uh, I yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, um, uh, it's a very boring question, I think. So wonderful as all this stuff, which is brilliant. Yeah, I, ask yeah, you about anything, I, I don't hear anything. Um, I've got my microphone on. Can you I'm hear me? I'm wondering whether I have to rejoin Zoom. Or maybe um, uh, Maybe you process? can scroll. You can scroll to see him. Robert I was saying something. Yeah, yeah. I can't hear you here. You can't hear him? Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bob, can you, can you repeat? Microphone? Can you okay. repeat? Am I here now? Say something again. <laughs> no, no, I don't hear you. Um, sorry, then I will log out and get back in immediately. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Uh, okay, so try to say something. Marcus, can you hear me? No, it's really strange. Hmm. Um, now I do. Hmm? Zugato, did you say something? Uh, uh, yeah, I can I can hear Robert, so maybe I can translate. The, I can continue the question. So okay. you, yeah, go ahead, Robert. Ask. It's a very simple question. When you talked about it's a technical question, really. When you were aligning, when you set this set, set your experiment up originally and the alignment, and you were saying it took you about a year to yeah. do the alignment. Yeah. Did I hear you correctly? Yes. It's well, no, in hindsight, one could probably do things better, but actually, for essentially all of our interferometers, we, we've built six in total, huh? and um, each of them took a while to align. And, and the reason is that. Um, well, the, the relative, length different, dis, uh, relative length difference has to be um, on the order of um, 100 ppm. So if you have a two meter machine, it has to be 10 to the minus four of the length accuracy, which is still okay. It's only, uh, say, 50 microns. But then the roll angles have to be on the level of 100 microradians. You have to align it to gravity. You have to make sure that the Coriolis forces are compensated. Mm. Um, the tilt angles are kind of critical. The laser frequency has to match the um, the, um, the, the grating period to within um, a tenth of an angstrom and the mechanical grating periods are not super accurate and they also depend on the, on the, on the yaw angle of the gratings. Mm. So there's some subtleties and in the beginning if you don't know whether it's the vibration of the super long instrument or if it's your alignment mm. you, you work on different sides of the experiment. Yeah so did you just follow kind of a fairly strict procedure of doing one thing and then the other and so on? I mean, is that, am I being a bit naive now? But I mean, did you do uh, it with the actual beam or did you get some sort of laser in there to 
line everything up. <clears throat> um, of, of course, you, you try first to get a good um, signal that, that the count rates are okay, but um, then all the alignment criteria um, get a bit less stringent if you have a narrower beam, a narrower height, a narrower width. Mm. You try to get to the lowest possible width and height, but then there's hardly any signal, so it takes quite quite a long time to optimize that. Yeah. So you go for the big beam directly, but then you have to make many tiny tiny steps of your grating separations. So it's it's really a big parameter range in the beginning. Um, mm. But yeah. we, you we learn from that, and it will be better in the next round. Did you actually did one of your guys write a paper on on how you did all this, or is that just? As um, of course, we have research papers on the results, but uh, not about, about the alignment procedure. You may want to look into one paper that we wrote in New Journal of Physics in 2009, where we describe a number of these um, these alignment criteria. I can send it to you. Please, if you wouldn't mind, that would be great. We're about to get to a situation with ours, and uh, I wanted to make sure we were covering yeah, and of course, there's um, the PhD thesis of Stefan Gerlich and Jakob Fein, also highly recommended. Um, okay, that's the that kind thing. of thing where it would be in the in the thesis. Yes. Yes. Yeah. If you could send me that reference, that would be that would be great. That's yeah. very hard of you. Thank you. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Okay. I, thank you, Jasa. Yeah. If other people have questions, maybe they can raise their hands. In the I I can see these uh, participants. That'll be good if someone. Uh, so, so meanwhile, I will probably ask you a question, Marcus. While while uh, we check, wait for other people to, you know, anyone to raise hand. Is this uh, the, this initial increase of this coherence length that you spoke quite early on in your talk that uh, that it was this uh, some some femtometers uh, was the de Broglie wavelength and then mm -hmm. somehow the first grating with the gaps mm -hmm. that that increased the coherence length. So, can you explain that? Yes. Know, how did that happen? Actually, so you always have to distinguish between two different coherence lengths, um, the transverse and the longitudinal coherence. The longitudinal coherence is just a spectral property. So it's, it's a wavelength distribution or velocity distribution. And this you can only improve by selecting the velocity. And typically, we're not better than delta V over V of 10%, um, which is lousy compared to atom interferometry. But um, there's no proper cooling for complex molecules yet. So um, this is what we have. So the longitudinal coherence length is typically only of the order of say 10, 20 diploid wavelengths. And that's extremely tiny. That's 100 femtometers for these big molecules, mm -hmm. um, a, a bit more, a picometer. And <clears throat> uh, the transverse coherence on the other hand, that is a source property in terms of source size. Um, it's like uh, if you want to use the sun as a, as a source for coherence experiments on the earth. And you right. can do that because the source, the sun appears under a very tiny angle. And you can make it more coherent by shrinking the effective open angle. And we do that by squeezing, this is not squeezing in the quantum sense, but by, by pushing uh, the molecules through tiny slits or let them come from a tiny source from the beginning. Yeah. And that is also why the nanoparticle traps right now are interesting because um, if you trap them in a ground state of a harmonic oscillator, um, these ground states are typically very tiny. Um, and so that is a very good first source. So then the part from the source to the first grating, that, is, that, that can be shortened quite a bit and that can be improved quite a bit by cooling and by having a very localized source. Right. The, the rest of the evolution, um, that is not so easy to control by the source itself, because then you still need interference. Um, and, and that requires a short, uh, sorry, long de Broglie wavelength, but in the presence of gravity, everything will just fall mm. and accelerate. And that is very hard to avoid unless you have a trapped interferometer, which you can also think about, but then you have to think about a trap that does not spoil your phases. Mm. Okay, okay. Thank you, Marcus. Um, yeah, does uh, anyone, uh, maybe people can just unmute and ask a question also. Yeah, that is that is probably more straightforward. Anyone wants to fire off a question? Okay. Yeah, there is one from Ian. Hi, hi, Marcus. I uh, really enjoyed your talk. I come from biological mass spectrometry perspective, so this is not a quantum question, but we obviously in biology do a, 
a big, big challenge for us is the structure of the molecules so we can measure the mass really accurately in Fourier transform mass spec but it's still a big challenge for us to understand this the structure um, and it seems like you have some clever ways of this kind of molecule metrology kind of thing to get a handle on different things so I was just wondering you know what things you could see I mean for example like lipids we have this problem where the bonds can be at different positions in the molecule or the mm -hmm. different side chains and maybe that affects the polarizability which is one of the parameters mm -hmm. yeah I just wondered kind of you know what you saw as the power of your technique compared to what we currently do which is quite crude using like collision collisional experiments by yeah well actually um, um so, so there's a variety of things one can do, but it's all still in its, in its infancy, so to say. So currently we mostly measure scalar parameters like polarizability, susceptibilities, also magnetic susceptibilities, dipole moments, and indirectly that also gives some information about the structure of these things. Actually, we've looked at, um, for instance, if um, we had azobenzene molecules, uh, derivative of azobenzene molecules, and, and they are floppy and they shake, and they induce by vibration a dipole moment. And this kind of internal dynamics shows up in the effective susceptibility. So indirectly, we see that in deflection of fringes in external fields. Um, we're also preparing experiments to do photoisomerization, where a single photon flips the conformational state, and again, either the dipole moment or um, and the hydrocholesterol, even the magnetic susceptibility would change. And that is something that we can measure. Um, for, um, I know that, and I'm aware of the fact that the biologists would probably love the most if we had a, a, a possibility to have a full 3D structure of a protein mm -hmm. or so. That is very hard to do this way. Uh, changes in structure, we would see as changes in, um, in scalar parameters. Probably one can also probe them and as you say, you, you do collisions in drift cells. Uh, we would do it on the single molecule level in collisional decoherence. It's very similar in, in style, but more sensitive, it's really on the single molecule level. Um, and then you would have to introduce a small collision cell and uh, look for the decoherence rates as a function of what kind of gas you admit, if it's a chiral mm -hmm. gas, if it's a polar gas, if it's whatever. But um, yeah, there we still, yeah, very interesting though. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, maybe we will um, wrap up unless there is, uh, you know, um, well, I mean, there are, of course, zillions of questions. I, I think people can uh, still write to Marcus if, if they have the questions. And um, yeah, otherwise, uh, we can uh, probably thank Marcus today. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You can unmute and uh, 